Okay, so I'm the host for today, and I just uh, I invited um, Tom Mitchell from UCL to come and give a talk. It'd been great if he could come in person. It's not very far for him to come, but unfortunately, because of COVID, it's going to be a virtual talk. Um, so Tom did uh, his bachelor's in geology at the University of Liverpool. Then he was a, a PhD student also at University of Liverpool. Then he did a series of postdocs as he traveled around the world. He was a couple of years in Japan, a couple of years in Germany, and then a couple of years in Rome. So, you know, very well traveled. And then he became a, uh, I guess, initially assistant professor at UCL in 2013. And last last year he made full professor. So congratulations to him on, on that. Um, so he specializes in earthquakes and rock physics. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of work with him or trying to initiate some pilot work with him, looking at the effect of uh, earthquakes on magnetism. That's why I sort of, that's why I invited him. But I don't think he's going to be talking about that today. So um, over to you, Tom. What, one, one last thing before Tom starts. Just we're going to have questions. I'm going to if you can put the questions in the chat and then we'll try and answer the questions after the talk. OK, over to you, Tom. OK, well, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, that's great. Yeah, that's right. Adrian's right. We've uh, I, I have been all over the world. And I just think, as Adrian was saying, that, that, that I, I post a lot. And the reason why was because I actually had some really good advice from supervisors and mentors at the early stage is to not worry too much about the future and, uh, and that they wish they post up more. So we're trying to enjoy that. So I, I did that. So the getting a permanent job stress only really sort of kicked in in my third postdoc. So anyway, um, so yeah, t today I'm going to be talking about fast faults of fluids and the earthquake cycle. Um, uh, so I'm an experimentalist and a field geologist. And I sort of combine the two to try and understand, you know, what we see in the field and put numbers to it by trying to re re recreating it in the lab. Um, so I'm going to be talking about things generally that happen. The theme is sort of things that happen more quickly than we used to as geologists. You know, we think of geology in millions of years. These are sort of things, processes that can happen, you know, in seconds or even faster in some cases that might actually surprise you. So this nice picture here is a, is a drone image of the Laguna Salada Fault in Baja, uh, California, Mexico. So just south of San Diego across the uh, U.S. border. Um, here is a nice DEM for, built from a, tw uh, many of you probably are using drones, we use drones a lot now for field mapping, it's almost as uh, important a tool as it comes as clinometer. Um, just, this is a DEM built from structure and motion photogrammetry just from a single 20 minute flight or across the fault and actually picks up very nicely the fault core there, I'll come back to our fault cores and damage zones a bit uh, shortly. Um, but you can see here, you know, this nice breaker slope and also earthquake scarps uh, uh, as well, which I'll come to. So why do we study faults? Um, well, faults control fluid transport and strength in the crust. We write this sort of thing in grants, you know, trying to sell it to NERC and get this funded and so on. But actually, we're quite lucky in some ways because faults do control some really important things. They're not so hard to sell. They they, they control earthquakes. They host earthquakes. Um, so studying allows them to, us to understand how earthquakes nucleate. Uh, they control permeability and the seismic cycle, which I'll come back to. So everything is a big cycle in terms of fluids and rock strength. They control the uh, transport and deposition of minerals. So those are often economically important minerals like uh, copper or gold or lithium, which is all the rage now with electric cars and so on. Also oil and, and, and geothermal, um, and, and they can trap fluids and, or let them escape depending. But the, the point I wanted to bring across today in my talk is that most of this action uh, takes place during seismic ruptures. So actually during the earthquakes, so uh, very quickly. So this is a, um, a, a drone video hopefully you can see of that same uh, Laguna Salada, just, well, that's, everybody likes an unnecessary Thursday drone video, right? That's what we're having. So here we're looking along the fault core. This is a long strike of the fault. On the left, you can see about um, stri uh, natural springs, um, uh, geothermal springs are actually hot. So you can see lots of life in there because they're warm. You can see uh, green algae and all sorts of fish and so on as you fly across there. Uh, uh, calcium carbonate forming as well because it's bringing uh, minerals. Um, and so if I just sort of, uh, delineate the fault zone here with some simple imagery um, um, uh, uh, overlays. You can see here uh, what we have is a fault damage zone and a fault core. The core is where we have the slip, the, uh, the, the earthquake slip, and the damage zone is kind of a body of rock which contains uh, a variable amount of fractures. And the interesting thing is that the, these these fractured zones are, are kind of channels for fluids uh, and many other things. And in this case, it's exactly why uh, this uh, hot geothermal fluid is coming up from depth. And this map on the left shows a heat map of um, of 
Mexico. Um, you can see a zoom in this black box here on the bottom left. You know, so this is a zone of you know a much higher heat flow in this particular case. And this fault zone is essentially channel channeling these geothermal fluids. So in terms of geothermal energy and so on, faults are super important because those are the, the conduits that bring hot fluids uh, from, from depth to the surface. Now, faults are important for earthquakes. Everybody knows that. Um, this is a uh, map from the USGS showing magnitude five and a half earthquakes and greater over the last 20, 30 years or so. Um, you can see here in yellow, the size of the yellow uh, dots uh, um, sort of scale with earthquake magnitude, and you can see in red uh, uh, the actual faults. And you can see here, it's it's super clear, is that where we have faults, big faults, strands of the San Andreas, this is Southern California, so you've got San Diego down the bottom and uh, Santa Cruz and uh, San Francisco up further up off the image. Where you have faults, you have earthquakes. And those actually, actually just looking at the earthquakes in, in California is actually how they go about map mapping the faults. Some of the faults are blind, but they can delineate where those faults are by looking at the seismicity. So this just goes to show how faults are so important in terms of uh, controlling um, the location of earthquakes and aftershocks as well. Um, and also this famous uh, image of just showing like cross sections through, and it also shows you know this seismicity happens you know in the top. Uh, 20 kilometers or so, of course, uh, above the brittle ductile transition. So we've got faults that are sort of within the brittle crust uh, and, and are controlling a significant amount of the location of seismicity and so on. So this, this I, I touched on this before, the fault seismic cycle is kind of the framework I want to present everything in today. What is a seismic cycle? So let's imagine we've got a fault. This is the um, this is the San Andreas fault. You've probably seen these sort of uh, iconic images before of the San Andreas fault from planes. It's probably about 10 kilometers along here. Um, there's a simple equation here uh, about, uh, relating fault strength to a few things. OK, so, you know, when when the stress on the right here equals the fault strength, that's when we have a, an earthquake. And obviously the stress has changed with time. Um, we have a cohesion term. We have a friction because friction is strongly controls earthquakes. I'll come back to that later. Um, we also have stress, uh, the stress in the fault you can see in red and also the pore fluid pressure. So let's imagine our hands are pushed together and the, the stress on that fault, the, the normal stress at least is, is the, the total amount of stress we're pushing on that fault. But the fluid pressure works against that. You know, so if I were to pump fluids in between my hands with a straw, that would uh, actually work. That would open my hands and, and weaken them. So you can actually induce earthquakes by either increasing uh, um, uh, the, the shear stress or by it, or increasing the pore fluid pressure uh, based on this equation. Now, in terms of a cycle, um, um, we have a, a te tectonic loading cycle. So when we have an earthquake, we have a sudden release of all that seismic energy and that uh, dis dissipates and so on. We, we, we drop the stress on the fault. Um, uh, and that's what we call a co-seismic period. But, and that happens very quickly. Uh, but then we have the interseismic period, which is where that stress is dropped, but then it builds up slowly over, over time uh, until eventually that reaches the strength and we, ha we, we have an earthquake and the cycle resets. On top of that, we have the pore fluid cycle. So um, directly after an earthquake, let's say some cheesy photoshops here, but we may suddenly induce damage. And that's what I'll talk about uh, a bit later, instantaneous damage. We put, uh, a bunch of earthquake energy goes into the ground, creates a lot of fractures, and all of a sudden, because there's fractures, the, the ground is more permeable and fluids can move around. So that allows fluids to move and fluid pressures to be es escape. Um, so we have a very instantaneous change of fluid pressures. But of course, under the ground, it's hot and high pressure. And actually, fractures don't always remain uh, um, fractures for long. They can actually seal. So you can actually hide, a uh, and that's pressure and temperature control, the rates at least. And so these, the healing can actually happen really quickly as well. So once the fractures start healing, that permeability goes down and fluid pressures can build up, which means the fluid pressure can go up and you can also um, um, you know, induce an earth, lower the strength and, and, and induce an earthquake that way. So it's a combination of uh, of, uh, of pore fluid and tectonic loading as well. And this is a, this was a sort of summary diagram from a, a famous Simpson paper. Uh, this is kind of um, a schematic diagram highlighting that this is stress versus time, fluid pressure versus time and permeability versus time. And you can see here when we have an earthquake, there's a drop in stress. Uh, the permeability, sorry, the fluid pressure drops because the permeability goes up, super permeability. Uh, and then uh, uh, what we see is the strength goes right up. And then uh, over time, as that permeability reduces because the fractures are healing, you actually start seeing poor fluid pressures starting to build up because they can't escape. And it pressurizes and that reduces the strength. So where the strength hits the stress, we have an earthquake. So this goes to show you some of the controls here on earthquake reoccurrence. It's actually why it's so difficult because we've got to understand not only the stresses that are going on, but also the changes in the fracturing, the permeability and, and where those things are happening and also the healing as well.
Um, and this, this, I, I put this image in because this is effectively the same system as as a hovercraft. Let's imagine the hovercraft is off and it's just sitting there statically. Obviously, it's very difficult for you to push uh, because the fluid pressure is effectively zero. But if you, when you turn this um, hovercraft on, the pressure starts. It's blowing into that curtain underneath. It's blowing uh, air down, so the sort of fluid pressure or gas pressure is going up, and that actually lowers the strength and that actually allows you, you, know, you could potentially push that yourself. So um, that, that's just showing an example of the you know the weight of the hovercraft versus the pressure underneath um, working against each other. So I just wanted to show you a summary schematic of a, a fault zone here. Um, this is a, um, a schematic at the top here showing a fault core on a damage zone. Um, faults generally scale in size from little faults that you might see as a geologist in the field up to huge faults like the San Andreas that go all the way through the crust top to bottom. What we tend, tend to see, we have to simplify these structures, we, we see a fault core and that fault core is where the majority of that fault slip happens, you know, the, um, um, in which case it can be hundreds of kilometers and big faults. And then Outside of that, we have a fractured damage zone, and that's kind of a zone of fracturing where you've got a range of fracturing from very high density of fractures close to fault where all the earthquakes happen. And as you go further away from the fault, that fracturing falls off to kind of background levels. And we see these, these sort of these damage, these zone of fractures sort of scale uh, with the size of the fault. So a bigger displacement fault like San Andreas has a bigger fault damage zone. Um, this is a sort of similar sch uh, schematic, but as I was saying here at the, at the bottom, um, here you can see a schematic diagram of a sort of a wavy fault. And you know, if, if as I mentioned before, if we get close to the fault, the fracture density increases. That means if you've got more fractures, then more fluids can more out, move around more easily, so the permeability goes up. So you can see here a 3D diagram showing that you know as you get closer to the fault core, the permeability increases. Actually, when you get to the fault core, the permeability drops significantly. That's because fault core, uh, the fault core hosts material like cataclysites and fault gouges, very fine grain of very impermeable. So actually, the fault core, uh, while the damage zone outside is very permeable, the fault core itself is very impermeable and is often a lateral uh, a lateral barrier. And that's often what we see in say hydrocarbons and so on. The faults actually uh, act as traps for fluids as well around the core. Uh, and also um, strength as well. The more fractures, more micro fractures we have in something, the weaker it becomes. Uh, and so, so, so you have changes in strength. So in that whole fracture damage zone, you have a range in permeability of fracture damage and, and, and strength going on. Now, how we quantify that in the field is an example uh, here, and I'll show some more field photos in a second. This is a fault core with a surrounding damage zone. What we tend to do is actually we just look at we we measure quantitatively the fractures as a function of distance. So you can see here from zero to about 160 meters, you can see the micro fracture density in this case measured on samples on uh, under the microscope falls off uh, um, about 150 meters wide, and that allows us to delineate uh, a damage zone width. And you can see here qualitatively, you know, 15, 70, 140 uh, micro fractures in quartz. Uh, that are obviously clearly going down as you get further away from the fault zone. I would add that these are all now fluid inclusion planes. Fluid inclusion planes are actually healed microfractures, so they're not permeable now. They were when this thing was at depth many millions of years ago. They've actually sealed up, and I'll come to that. So this was permeable, but now it isn't permeable. So I wanted to frame this talk a little bit in terms of the energy budget um, um, on the fault and off fault. So there's maybe a few seismologists listening. Um, so this is obviously fairly patronizing, but the, an earthquake converts its elastic strain energy stored into kinetic energy, okay? And predicting that radiated energy in the ground motion is one of the key jobs of the seismologists, right? But, but what we realize now is that only a fraction of that elastic energy is released entirely into uh, seismic waves. We also now know that quite a lot of energy is lost into the frictional heating on the fault uh, and actually creating new fractures and also some other chemical processes. So if we have a simple equation here, which relates the total stored elastic energy here uh, into it's sort of broken into three terms. One is the frictional energy, uh, the radiated energy and the fracture energy. And it's uh, um, so th this is the energy required to make new fractures as the earthquake happens and this is the frictional energy and i would argue we actually have a good understanding of the frictional energy now and i'm going to focus a bit on, on summarizing both of these seismologists look at this term so i'm kind of looking at it the other, other way around like what well, seismologists are thinking about the radiated energy and total ground shaking and so on we're trying to look at how much energy goes into the factoring fracturing and the friction so of the inverse to figure out how much energy might be left for what the seismologists are doing comparisons. 
So here's a nice example uh, of an exhumed fault system. Obviously, we can look at active faults on the San Andreas, but what's really going on is you know about 10 kilometers of depth where it's happening. Uh, we often use exhumed faults that, are that were 10 kilometers on the ground, but now have been exhumed uh, to the surface. This is a nice example from Chile, uh, a strike slip fault. This is a colleague of mine there from a drone view. You can see, and if I play around with the high spectral imagery there, you can actually see it picks up beautifully the fracture systems here. And in the center is a lot of iron rich staining in the fault core and all of these uh, complex fracture patterns and dikes off there. All this light green stuff is actually chloride and epidote staining and alteration there. So these have been big conduits for fluids. Another example of the same fault, looking at long strike it, you can see here, this is about 200 meter high cliff from a drone imagery. And you can see here, you know, really big damage zones here on this fault, uh, all of these sort of fractures here with all sorts of complex uh, fluid flow. So this shows really nicely that you've got these fracture systems that also are, that are sort of like a branching system, which, which allow fluids to come in, but those fluids have then allowed alteration and precipitation and so on. It's a very dynamic uh, system. Um, examples of uh, active fault systems. Um, so that, um, so the Najima Fault and Kobe earthquake, 95, you probably remember these iconic images of the, the highway falling over. Um, this is actually uh, the surface rupture of about 1.8 meters uh, slip here. This is a rice field. You see a guy here for scale. Um, it's incredible offset. You hear, uh, uh, you can see here and it's showing that the the, the, the fault slip is happening very locally uh, in the fault core all of that very very fast slip is having very, in a very narrow fault core zone you can actually go there now they've actually built a museum this 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 fault scarp here is exactly the same outcrop on the left they built a museum over the top and they've actually cut down you can actually go in and have a look uh, at that fault core um, and that shows up quite nicely so we zoom in there you've got a very localized uh, fault core in this case is very clay rich and then you can see big uh, macroscopic fractures uh, outside of that as well. Um, very iron rich here because it's been carrying a lot of fluids and iron rich fluids in this area. Another example of a fault core, this is the punch bowl fault. That's a strand of the San Andreas. So this San Andreas is active, but this was now an inactive uh, fault. Uh, it's come up from deep. Um, it's had about 44 kilometers of slip. You can see a localized zone here. Um, the punch bowl formation, sandstone on the right, and basement on the left. Um, if we zoom in on that, you can actually see about a 20 centimeter wide zone of cataclasites. So really high strain rocks, very localized and so on. But if you zoom in even cl uh, 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 closer, you can actually see what we find, uh, what we call a principal slip zone. A principal slip zone is the zone where the majority of the earthquake slip is, is thought to happen. In this case, it's a couple of millimeters. So if you think about um, um, the energetics of this in terms of, you know, this fault has had 44 kilometers of slip and this is a thin section, right? You know, then the majority of that slip is likely have occurred uh, um, seismically um, uh, stick slip events within this really narrow uh, slip core. And that's actually got big implications for frictional heating, which we'll come to in a second. Another really example um, from Chester et al. in Science 2013. You probably all, you all remember the Tohoku earthquake, um, uh, and that was incredible. I remember this. This this uh, rice field had about two meters of slip. Um, uh, the Tohoku earthquake, even though we couldn't see on the surface, had nearly 50 meters of slip. You know, length of a swimming pool, if you think of that rice field going up 50 meters, an enormous amount of slip in a place we didn't expect it. Uh, this project called the JFAST drilling project uh, uh, was where actually relatively quickly within a few years after the earthquake, they actually took the, the famous uh, drilling boat, the Shikyu, out. They went through seven kilometers of water. They drilled through the subduction zone and actually into the, into the, split, in, into the fault. Uh, which ruptured during the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which is incredible if you think about it, going through seven kilometers of water and then retrieving, you know, several hundred meters of core and bring it to the surface. And they were interested in drilling through this zone. And what they found, you know, this is this is the core here, guys, probably about, you know, a thousand pounds per gram or something like that. It's insane amounts of money to do these sort of things. But they're important because here they identified this shear surface. And this what this again showed that, um, that there's been a very localized slip. In this case, this 500, sorry, 50 meters of slip had happened in a very narrow slip zone. And that's the message you're probably getting now that a lot of this coast seismic earthquake slip happens in a very narrow slip zone. Another example from the Kaikoura earthquake with the uh, uh, gratuitous um, um, drone shots here. You've probably see, seen this in social media. It's been quite quite a while now since uh, this earthquake. Um, again, a uh, very localized uh, slip, uh, and many of these events um, uh, are showing these big fault scarps that are, that are happening here. And you can see there is also associated damage uh, adjacent, but the majority of the slip happens in, in these fault cores. So the message I'm trying to bring across here is that earthquakes are due to slip on fault surfaces. 
Um, um, and, and, and this is an example of a, a, an active fault um, in carbonates in Italy, the Gubbio fault, you may have seen before, in this case, a normal fault. So, you know, the earthquake slip, the earthquakes are happening in very narrow slip zones. So it's therefore really important for us to understand what's going on these surfaces, which has certainly been a focus of many people for the last 10, 15 years now. And in particular, frictional properties of those of, of, the, of these surfaces, because they it's the frictional properties that in part control the physics of some of these earthquakes. And just to go into friction a little bit, I'm not sure what your background, I know there's some engineers in the audience. Could somebody just come online and say you can still hear me? I'm assuming you can. Somebody just say yes, because I can't see anyone. Um, yes, yeah. I still hear you. Great. Uh, this fear that I'm just talking to another wall and I can't. <laughs> you, you've all dropped off. Okay. So um, this is friction. So friction. Uh, there's a, a famous paper back uh, by um, uh, James Bailey uh, in the early well, late 70s, and he did a bunch of experiments where he took two pieces of granite blocks and he measured the the weight versus the shear stress. Uh, on that block for all sorts of different rocks, all sorts of different pressures like this. And he found this Bailey friction rule that pretty much is, it's, it shows the friction, which is the ratio of the shear stress to the normal stress. So if you double the weight, you have to double the amount of load to be able to push that. So if you double the weight of a car, you'd have to double uh, the the low, um, the force that you put on to move it, right? And he found this was pretty standard, this relationship for 0.85 for, uh, for um, low pr stress, uh, pressures and 0.6 um, um, for uh, elevated pressures. And this was a sort of standard frictional coefficient regardless of the rock types. Some other slightly wacky rules for clays, but I won't touch that today. So we found that then, so this is the sort of standard uh, coefficient of friction that people have been using to model earthquakes over, over many years. But what we realized in the last 20 years now, um, 10, 15, 20 years. I used to say 10 years when I gave this slide, and now I realize I'm getting old. 20 years. Um, friction actually can be dra dramatically reduced um, at, at, when you start getting to earthquake speeds. So, this is a, an, um, a summary paper in log space. You see log slip rates. So, uh, it's like 10 meters per second, so really fast down to minus. Uh, uh, minus 10 to the minus 11. So this is effectively uh, uh, natural creep rates on the left, you know, subduction plates really, really slow to our sort of standard experiments, tracks, experiments that we do. And what you see is actually the friction, Bailey friction really does agree uh, for, for most rocks and all sorts of ex experimental settings really does hold true up to you get to about something like one centimeter per second. And you actually see that all the data starts to diverge. And this is something that's happened in the advent of high velocity experiments. And what it's shown is that when you start sliding uh, fast, I fasten a few millimeters per second, then the friction can drop. And if you look at this plot, this is actually saying that the frictional coefficient is zero almost in some of these points. What does that mean? If, if the frictional coefficient of my shoes was zero, I wouldn't be able to stand up, right? If the friction of the coefficient of your car tires was zero, you could just push that and it would slide and, and, and wouldn't stop apart from air friction. And so um, why is that? Well, um, I'm just going to, I've just found uh, this animated GIF this morning. It is almost Friday and almost the end of the term. Congratulations for everyone for hanging in, staff and students. Um, this, I put this in just to demonstrate this effect of frictional heating. So on a cold day, you might rub your hands together. It's not cold today, despite me wearing a hat. It's cold in my house. Um, for more, if you put more pressure on your hands or rub for longer, it gets warmer. So I'm assuming you're all trying this at home, right? This is what I normally would do in the class. So we can actually calculate the uh, um, the um, base, you know, base the friction of our skin. We can calculate how warm our hands would become as a function of how much we slip it and the pressure we put on. If we've got the coefficient of friction, the stress, the distance, and the size of our hands, for example, we can calculate the temperature, uh, delta T, just by you know a few simple A level uh, calculations, knowing the specific heat capacity of skin, density, and the thickness of skin. Uh, combining those equations and then plugging in some numbers. Turns out the coefficient of skin is 0.4. You look that up, so it's less than rocks. It's interesting. Um, special heat, heat capacity, if you assume a thickness of the slip zone, like our earthquake slip zone of about um, a, a millimeter, um, similar to our fault zone width and density and the stress of maybe a maximum of five kilograms, we can calculate that for a single three centimeter swipe, temperature rises about 0.1 degrees Celsius. You know, So if we do a bigger swipe, we get higher temperature, or if we double the pressure, we can uh, increase it. So you probably be able to get a couple of degrees increase. Now imagine that at 10 kilometers depth, like much, much higher, uh, much, much higher pressures. All right. You know, where you've got, you know, uh, MPAs of stress, then the frictional heating won't just be a couple of degrees. It can be hundreds to thousands of degrees. And, and, and so if you do the math, actually, if you've got a slip zone of an earthquake, at say five or six kilometers depth, 
uh, and the slip zone, as I've shown you, is very narrow, then you can get within millimeters of slip of displacement temperatures of from zero up to 1400 degrees Celsius, which is above the ma majority, uh, the melting temperature of rocks. And we see that in the field. So some of you may have heard of pseudotaclites before. These are and these were controversial for a while, less controversial nowadays, since people started making them in a lab and proving you can get them. These are very glassy rocks that were molten uh, um, uh, frictional melts at some point, uh, and they've lubricated the earthquake. We often have these injection veins uh, off them. The reason why is when you melt rock uh, into its liquid form, um, you get uh, an increase in the volume of about 18 to 20 percent. So if you don't increase the actual space and it becomes pressurized, so they inject off all over the place. And in various experiments, people have been building um, uh, high velocity machines. It's a machine where it takes two pieces of rock together, pushes them together, kind of earthquake pressures, and then spins them around at high velocity, you know, meters per second. And I'm just going to show you an example of that. The sound probably won't work for you. This is two pieces of gabbro pushed together with pressure and then start spinning it round. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. So what you're seeing here is, is, is melting of rocks. Now there's no external heating there. Let me just show you that again. Um, there's no external heating. This is purely frictional heating, right? Uh, so we've gone from zero to above a thousand degrees Celsius in less than a second actually with those things. So that actually happens in earthquakes and that no longer have we got two rocks against each other. We've actually got two rocks sandwich, sandwiching a piece of, uh, of, of magma, of lava, right? And the viscosity is, uh, can, be, can vary significantly. That can actually lubricate. And this is why we get this drop in, in significant friction. Uh, and there's many things now we're discovering that like all sorts of things that you move very high speed, you actually drop the friction significantly co-seismically. It could be melt or so on. Uh, and that's now sort of well understood that earthquakes very easily uh, and small amounts of slip uh, will uh, will melt the rock and cause local lubrication. Now it's so well known as actually now people are arguing, why don't we see pseudotaclites everywhere? If it's so easy to melt them, if you imagine an earthquake with a bunch of aftershocks, you know, we've got tens of thousands of aftershocks. Look at the aftershocks have been happening and, uh, and in Iceland at the moment, for example, you would expect to see pseudotaclites everywhere. You don't. And so I'm going to show you an experimental example where you don't actually get melting. So this is, this is gypsum. This is another exper experiment my colleague Nick Brontu um, in, in gypsum, I'll just get the video to about here. He's got two pieces of gypsum, he's pushing them together. Now the difference with gypsum is that gypsum dehydrates just under 100, 100 degrees Celsius. So as I start this experiment at high velocity, you can probably see the sound this time. The temperature of rockets up and then what you're seeing now is not powder, that is steam coming out. So actually, as soon as it hits the dehydration temperature, the temperature is buffered at that dehydration temperature uh, until all. So what's happening is a re, there's an endothermic reaction going on, and that gypsum is completely dehydrating and using all the energy. And eventually, you do start to see the rock glowing. Now you see there's no steaming coming out because it's dehydrated the whole sample, and now the temperature can rock it off. So what that's actually shown quite nicely is that um, um, if you've got anything in your fault zone that uh, that will dehydrate or de uh, decarbonate. You can actually buffer the temperature so that actually the, the temperature will rock it off up to that dehydration or decarbonation temperature and it will just plateau there. It will never go off to melting. Um, and so there's lots of ways we're now realizing why you don't always get melting. It's actually a bit more complicated than we thought. For example, clays, right? We know that clays all can de dehydrate around 300 to 500 degrees Celsius, way below any melting temperature. And guess what? Most fault cores that we see in the field have clays. So there you go. There's actually a reason why you can actually inhibit the temperature rise. And so the more experiments we do at high velocity, we're realizing just how complicated uh, it is. So, you know, uh, I think these endothermic co-seismic reactions actually are really important. You wouldn't realize, really think that these sort of reactions are happening so quickly, but they do. So um, I just wanted to, um, uh, so I, I was talking about this. So that was just kind of summarizing what we know about um, um, high velocity friction. I would argue now, colleagues would disagree. I would argue that we have a lot better idea what goes on terms of this frictional energy term. And um, the bit we don't understand as much is this um, this fracture energy term, how much energy, you know, goes into creating uh, fractures off fault. Because I've seen, as I've shown you from examples, sorry, my mouse is jumping around here. As I've shown you from examples, um, uh, uh, we can have huge, vo uh, you know, huge volumes of fractures around fault zones, you know, and obviously earthquakes have, you know, a big fault have had many, many earthquakes, tens of thousands of earthquakes. So it's been cumulative. So how do we sort of separate out individual uh, earthquakes and understand how much energy goes into creating fractures for just one earthquake? Um, so Firstly, we've got geophysical evidence other than exhumed faults for, for fault zone damage um, and, and seismologists and fault zone um, 
geophysicists work together a lot. This is a simple plot of velocity versus time, of crustal velocity. So this is like the P wave velocity, for example, which is what seismologists use for, for measuring things. So imagine that we've got a schematic here of an intact crustal rock, right? I mean, it's a fairly high velocity, let's say five or six kilometers per second, something like that for granite. If we suddenly induce a bunch of damage, which are caps like graps like that uh, and fractures, then the velocity drops. Okay, so we can uh, uh, seismologists can use zones of low velocity to infer where there might be crack damage. And the, the, you know, the more cracks you have, the lower the velocity might be. We do that in the lab. What we also see naturally around in seismic, seismic studies is actually the velocity drops after earthquakes, but it also increases as a function of time. And that's a bit we don't really understand. I could give a whole talk on that, but I'm not going today, pointing out what we don't understand. Some, I'll hint at it later. Um, we think that's probably due to things like sea and healing and fluids coming in there uh, and so on but that's uh, um, uh, to come later so yeah this is just my cheesy photoshop again of an intact rock uh, and then we have a fracturing co-seismic fracturing but then over time of course pressure and fluids um, 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 and temperature all affect the rock and we'll see a low fractures which will also increase the false velocity and just showing you sort of the advancements of uh, of geoph geophysics you know this is the sort of stuff I would, you know, 10 years ago be showing a paper by Crocker and um, this is tomography around strands of the San Andreas fault. Um, um, you can see the scale here, kilometer scale. More recently, we have really high resolution tomography, fantastic new techniques in seismology and so on, uh, and also really dense deployments. So you can see here on this plot in the top right in Google Earth, this is fault, it's 200 meters. Actually, each of these dots is, uh, you know, it's actually a seismometer. So people are putting, you know, hundreds of and thousands in some cases seismometers to really get ultra high resolutions of imagery and we can see with these low velocity zones where uh, the fault damages and, and so on so now you know we've got some incredible uh, seismological techniques um, the geophysical physical evidence uh, also uh, suggests healing and that that zone I showed you earlier fault zone in Chile uh, this is a big uh, fault core fracture damage zone here it's all green uh, because it's full of chloride and epidote so it's had lots of hydrothermal minerals that have come in through the fracture system and precipitated there and hardened that up um, and actually, the, the seismic studies on the right here is a couple of examples from, uh, from science and so on. This is uh, uh, inverse of velocity. So after the part field earthquake, a big uh, magnitude six, there's a big drop in velocity. Uh, and this then uh, came back to normal over uh, over several years. Also, after the Landers earthquake here, uh, there was a drop in velocity and that started to heal as a function of time. So we know that damage is put in during earthquakes, but we actually don't really understand what's going on under the bonnet of why those fractures are healing. But, you know, it's not geological time scales we're talking about. These fractures are healing and closing, you know, on, on the order of years, a few years, not tens of thousands of years. And actually, in the lab, it can happen even faster, which I will come back to later. So, um, uh, yeah, that was just a, a, a sort of summary. As I've showed you the slide already of, of fault zones. We have the core and damage zone and uh, fractures, and they can uh, fluids can move through there. Um, so, in terms of the origin of fr fault fracture damage, um, it can be really complicated, right? There's, there's Let's imagine at the top here, we've got a fracture when it's first formed, it's really small, you see it in the field, we have uh, initiation damage related to when it first forms. Of course, all faults have nearly nearly always got a neighbor nearby, you don't have to walk far, and so they start interacting, you have all sorts of dilational spots and so on like this. You also have stress concentrations in the process zone at the tip, so the longer the fault, the higher the stress is at the tip, and so there's a bigger zone of fractures relaxing that stress at the tip. Of course, not all faults are beautifully plain as we'd like uh, when we're thinking about this theoretically, they're actually rough so you've got all sorts of geom uh, geometric irregular irregularities that are juxtaposed against each other causing all sorts of crazy stress concentrations and of course earthquakes when you get when the fault is big enough you have um, 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 damage related to earthquakes uh, imprinted so you actually go to a fault and you've got all of these things imprinted over each other and actually I, I put this slide in actually for seismologists many years ago with Bob Wallace who was the father of SCEC or Earthquake uh, Science Center many years ago and he got he had spent two days listening to modelers talking about you know um, elastic half space and penny uh, you know half penny shaped cracks in uh, homogeneous mediums and you, you got him said listen guys it's it's not this it's it's this it's 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 messy and he's right it is messy but we've still got to simplify things because we if, if we want to understand how things grow and I'll show you an example of some fault damage um, 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 you know how we can re re reproduce some of this damage in the lab uh, in this case this is um, uh, fault tip damage and this is an experiment so this is a uniaxial experiment on the right here so this is a high-speed camera so this is what normally happens you um, you increase the load in the sample uh, and that fracture forms so what happens is that lots of little fra fractures happen throughout the sample you can see these little vents here and then they coalesce and form one fracture and one that once that fracture nucleates 
that actually uh, um, then propagates really fast, you know, like kilometers per second. As soon as you've nucleated, the actual earthquake rupture zips across and goes really, really fast. And this paper um, by Dave Lochner in, in, in Nature in 1991 was really cool because normally when we break that sample, that's why we're using a high-speed camera here, um, it goes so fast, a blink of eye, you missed it, and we can slow it down um, in these experiments. Actually, in this, uh, in this slide, it actually happens it actually happens in um, recording at 60,000 60, frames per second, and it happens between two frames. That means on this image, it's ha it's 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 traveling at least 800 meters per second uh, from this camera. And so here, there's the technique where he slowed it down using some very clever feedback mechanisms and so on to actually watch this thing a rupture. And we've kind of reproduced this uh, these results, but actually now we've been doing some fairly advanced uh, laboratory tomography, and you can see this similar sort of so th this 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 propagation which would normally go at three kilometers per second we've managed to slow that down over several hours and you can see all of these little earthquake acoustic emissions events happening and forming as it propagates through the sample you can also see the velocity right so you can see uh, you know like uh, blue is intact velocity and you can see as that rupture tip migrates across the sample you can actually see a yellow zone of lower velocity so that's showing that as that fracture propagates we're actually forming a damage zone as it goes along it's sort of creating a wake of fracture damage behind the tip as it moves along very quickly. So we actually realize now that uh, fracture damage zones can be formed very early in, in faults as, uh, as earthquake ruptures uh, propagate. And for those of you interested, you know, there's some, you can see this fracturing, you know, a, this is a six, you know, six centimeter sample. And you can see we zoom in here, this, you know, this microzone of microfracturing strongly correlates nicely with this low velocity zone that we see in, in, in the tomography. And so that actually suggests that we've got a drop. Um, um, it shows a, a, a velocity drop of about 25%, which suggests that like the elastic moduli of the rock in that damage zone uh, has actually dropped by almost 50%, you know, just as that rupture propagates. So what we're realizing now when we look at fault zones is that um, is that when we have an earthquake rupture going along very, very fast, that rupture itself can leave a wake of damage um, that can uh, cause all sorts of uh, instantaneous changes to the, to the fault structure and to the fault properties. You know, this is the plot here of strain rate as a function of distance. You know, and if we want to reproduce the sort of damage uh, that we get um, around around earthquake ruptures, um, we're realizing that the that the, the the damage that you get closest to the fault is actually very, very high strain rate. We can't, uh, you'd have to go, you have to squash the rock very, very fast to, to recreate the conditions that you get close to the fault. Uh, further out, uh, you know, 50 meters away or so, we can use standard triaxial or uniaxial experiments where we do them slowly and the strain rates are much slower, but like we're realizing now that we we, we need really different uh, equ equipment to reproduce the, uh, um, the, the, the high speeds. Also, we have very strong compression around earthquakes and very strong tension. So not only do you have to squash rocks, but you have to sort of pull them very fast as well to really explore sort of damage. And this is an example of a, of a high speed impact experiment here of a colleague of mine this is uh, in microseconds um, you can see so this is within just half a second um, going super super fast you can see this total pulverization of the rock and this is the video you've seen before so this is the same peak stress in both of the experiments okay similar rock types the same peak stress but the only difference is that when you go very 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 fast you actually get tons and tons of lots of small fractures and pulverization whereas when you go slow you tend to pre preferentially form one fracture um, which i'll come back to in a second let me check the time. 38. OK, doing OK. So um, so I, so so I just put this come back to this slide, just showing that we've got sort of an understanding now of what's going on in terms of the melting um, uh, in the fault core and the, the frictional energy term. Um, still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and also now we're realizing that we can recreate the dynamic damage that you get around earthquakes with these sort of high speed impact experiments. But you can't do it with just uh, you know, experiments alone. You have to do these experiments, you know, in the context of, uh, you know, of detailed field studies of fault zones as well. And this paper, um, a guy called Stefan Nielsen uh, many years ago, um, well, not many years ago, 2016, was one of the first papers where he actually sort of compared, or re did a nice job of comparing um, this high velocity data to earthquake uh, seismologist data. So here we got fracture energy versus slip here on the bottom. So this is like earth, the amount of earthquake slip. And, and in red is all these high velocity experiments, all, all the data from the lit literature they have on high velocity experiments in red. And then all the other colors are all um, data taken from seismological studies, so remotely from seismologists. 
because seismologists often ask experimenters, oh, this is cool, you can melt a rock, but what does it really mean for me? How does this help us? And so this paper showed that, you know, so this is the sort of standard slips that you would get for magnitudes from three to seven. This is the range, for example. And what Stefan in this paper showed is that actually all of the, the frictional melting experiments, they all agree with the seismic estimates, suggesting, you know, most of the energy might be split between, you know, only on fault melting processes and, and seismic shaking. But when you get to really big earthquakes or earthquakes that are bigger than magnitude five, they diverge. Okay, so it's not just melting uh, uh, um, that is explaining this. And he's suggesting this paper that actually for the really big earthquakes, magnitude five and above, you really need to do, think about um, you know fracturing, co-seismic fracturing that happens during earthquakes, um, which is much more important for the bigger ones in terms of the energy budget. So to give you an idea of the scale of some of these fault systems, I put a couple of um, 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 uh, examples of faults here. Um, this is Chucky Kamata. Many of you may have seen this before. It's a huge a hole on that's the one way to put it a human made hole and the re sole reason is that, sole reason it's there is because a fault that goes right through it the west fisher fault uh it's about almost a kilometer deep and four kilometers long um and i realize when i'm down the hole how big it is when when you're here and you can see an explosion happen at the other end and then the sound comes in you know two seconds later you realize just how big it is but to give you an idea here if this is the geological amount overlay that all this uh purpley stuff is um uh is copper porphyry Actually, there isn't much on the other side. So where, where the other side of this copper mine is along the length of Chile is still actually a topic of, surprisingly, a topic of, uh, of you know, hotly debated stuff. <laughs> is it actually, is it uh, further along the length of Chile? They'll find it one day. Um, but to give you a sense of the scale here, if I zoom in uh, here, this is the student of mine standing on a fault core. You can see a very localized slip. Um, this is the fault going down the pit. Uh, but see that little dot down there? This is these trucks. These are trucks. So these systems are absolutely enormous. That's why I put this image and you hope you can see, understand the scale. This is a fault core, but the damage zone is, you know, hundreds of meters wide with huge amounts of fluids that have moved th through. In this case, it's put, you know, significant amounts of copper. And this is an example of a, um, a, a crack seal texture uh, that the geologists might enjoy, a defiance gold mine in Western Australia. This is a crack seal texture, so evidence of cracking and then fluids coming and sealing and precipitating uh, quartz and gold and then cracking again, sort of cyclic thing. A nicer example here, a crack seal and the Pilgrim's Rest in South Af Africa this year is the good stuff, uh, gold and quartz are precipitating there. Um, another example is uh, this is uh, behind this wall here. This is uh, from northern Iraq. It was a few years ago. Um, um, uh, there's a thrust fault and below that thrust fault is actually a high density of fractures, which decreases with distance. Um, Sorry, I've jumped a slide. Um, let me go back. Sorry. Uh, and you can see this is oil oozing out. You can see my bodyguard over there for scale. He's huge. He's about seven foot for reference. So this is an enormous amount of oil. So these fracture systems really are big and they really do control, you know, a lot of fluids uh, of different types going through them. Another example of faults, uh, this is um, uh, more recent stuff by a work of my PhD student, Giles Ostermeyer, that just graduated. Um, this is the 2010 rupture uh, of the uh, uh, um, uh, of this uh, of the Borrego fault, and you can see the rupture plane here uh, happened in 2010. We actually got a beautiful opportunity to go in there and look at fracture densities and so on. So now we're really trying to understand the heterogeneity and complexity of faults. You can see here this took my students something like uh, it's only 20 meter wide, but also several meters across. It took him about three months of complete tracing that. In red, we've got big substory faults and it shows it's really complicated, you know, this off fault damage. And this is a density of the fractures. So actually interesting here, you can see the density, which is in re highest in red, the highest density is where we have those red fractures, uh, the, the bigger um, off, the bigger splay faults actually start interacting. We get these zones of, uh, of, of, of concentration of overlapping faults and uh, higher fracture density. So faults get really complicated quick. And the, the, the higher resolution you look, the more you realize they are in terms of complex. But a lot of these spots actually have these heterogeneities and fracture density you also are heterogeneities in terms of fluid conduits as well, spots of high uh, fluid uh, uh, transmissibility. Another example of exactly that, this is uh, in, in, in Iceland. So there's intersecting faults. So there's video there. This is Hopefully you can hear that through my microphone. Is one of these mega wells they can call these inter uh, these, these hugely uh, flowing systems. This is the one they call the beast. It's about. Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to turn that down a little bit so you can hear me talk. This is uh, where well, you get down about 90 meters. This already 300, 300 degrees Celsius, so it's super hot, and there's a hugely fasting fluids moving in 
uh, moving through the system here. And if you look at the, uh, the geology here, this is the you know the, the really fractured uh, systems here. It's these intersections actually between the faults, which I was mentioned before, the complex intersections that are really you know strong conduits for fluids moving up. So much so, if you look at the uh, the cross section here, you can see um, you can actually see. Uh, um, uh, the, the zones are sort of in terms of the mineralogy going on. So where the, the temperature goes up higher, where you have these zones of fluid coming up fast towards the surface, you actually get chloride and epidote um, um, mineralization. The depths are just, you know, a thousand degrees. So you've got green, green chest fascist metamorphism going on just a kilometer depth because of the fast fluids coming up uh, and uh, bringing the temperature to the surface as well. So we get these really fast changes in permeability around the damage zone just by sudden changes in, in space. So if we have a dilational jog like this and we have suddenly had an earthquake and we suddenly opened up fractures you can uh, pretty much create uh, pathways of fluids and so you, you, if you open a fracture, the fluid pressure drops and that allows the fluids to move in very quickly and they can move really quickly actually um, and this is an example I showed you before. This is a right lateral jog with uh, quartz uh, and gold in there from a gold mine and so on. This is exactly that. As soon as you offset that jog, you can have quite a lot of space, depending on obviously the magnitude of the earthquake and the amount of displacement, and so have some really fast slip and fluids can move very, very quickly. It could also be that you've got fault valve action. So this is where you actually have a high pressurized fluids at depth. You break the seal and that fluids is suddenly allowed to escape. So the rupture breaks the seal. That's one way of doing it. Um, I am going to uh, skip this slide. No, I'm not going to skip this slide. So this is an example, actually, of when you, if you have this instantaneous opening of fractures, this paper in Weatherly uh, is a really nice conceptual paper a few years ago in Nature Geoscience, and it shows that if you suddenly dilate a fracture and the pressure drops, you can actually induce vaporization of quartz and gold just by the pressure drop. Because, of course, quartz uh, solubility here is strongly related to pressure. So if you suddenly open a fracture co from an earthquake, you'll also drop the pressure and you can also get minerals to dump out a solution. So he actually in this paper related the size of earthquake magnitude to the minimum fluid pressure and the amount of gold. So actually we're realizing now that things like gold and quartz are not necessarily related to processes that take millions of years. They can actually be very quickly deposited out of fluid solution uh, during earthquakes. And the bigger the earthquake is, potentially the more uh, gold might actually be deposited. And you, we see examples of this sort of flash vaporization. This is, I got married last year and uh, uh, and uh, we went to some um, geysers, um, um, beautiful hot springs in, uh, in California. Uh, and you can see here the hot springs. These are actually the pipes of the hot springs. And it's interesting when, when, you, when the pressure drops uh, um, as the fluids are coming up into the pipes, you actually have this flash precipitation. That's one of the reasons in geothermal systems, they often keep it pressure all the way to the top so it don't, they don't uh, precipitate minerals. Uh, and you can see a really nice example of that. That pipe has been cut and you can see they have to replace these pipes every three months. So this mineral is grown around the outside here. Is actually, has actually grown in about one and a half months. It grows super quick just because of the drop in pressure, this really fast mineralization. I don't know if you can see my camera here to the side. I've actually got a slice of this pipe. You can see this minerals there. I've got a nice uh, piece of that as well. My wife didn't really like me getting all geology into the geology when I was supposed to be on my honeymoon, but that's a side point. Um, anyway, so, and we see that in the field. So this is an example from a, a hydrothermal fault system in, in Southern Chile. Okay, a big fault system here. We'll go into details too much. There's some uh, students from Chile. It's on the side of a volcano here. And they've been drilling and prospecting for um, uh, for geothermal looking at it. But you actually see these sort of, these fracture systems where you've got these quartz and uh, calcium carbonate thing crystals growing. And, you know, and, and this is, this doesn't have to take millions of years. This can happen very quickly so long as you've got sudden, you know, and, and, and or uh, uh, pressure drops, uh, which can um, cause the mineralization. And, and just to um, just to uh, follow that idea of uh, you know fast moving pressures, let's imagine that we've got a fluid reservoir at depth, right? Uh, that's pressurized, and we often get trapped fluids at depth. Let's imagine we suddenly break the seal of that uh, of that um, um, that high pressure fluids, and we allow that fluid to migrate along the damage zone, which is where it will go. As I've shown, it's be very uh, very um, um, it's very permeable. So if you remember this equation relating a fault strength here, so imagine that we've got a fault that isn't anywhere near the strength, uh, um, so it's not, not going to fail an earthquake. As this fluid migrates along very quickly through the damage zone, the fluid pressure will rise and it'll actually reduce the strength. So, you, so that you can have a main, a main shock earthquake that breaks a seal and allows this fluid to come out. But then those fluids, as they migrate along and increase the pressure, can actually then induce aftershocks as the fluid is migrating. So these fluids moving fast can actually control migrating aftershocks. And there's a nice example uh, on the next slide from uh, Miller et al. in Nature. 
uh, examples of fast moving fluids and and so you may have heard of the colferito aftershock sequence in um 1997 um, this is uh, um, um, it was a really devastating earthquake. It was actually the aftershocks that caused more damage. The main shock uh, shook and weakened a lot of buildings, and the aftershocks brought many of them down. In in, in the Apennines, there's a lot of uh, carbonate, so a lot of natural high pressure CO2 uh, trapped under thrust and normal faults. And what they think happened here is that this main shock broke the seal of a high pressure CO2 reservoir, and then that CO2 escaped along a fault. And this is an animated GIF. Let me just wait for this to reset. This is 10 kilometer depth. And red, we've got high pressure. Blue, we've got low pressure. And you will see in a second, there we go. You rupture the seal and you can actually see the pressure migrating along the fault plane here. And in white, we've got the aftershock location. So what they suggested here, and bear in mind, this is 10 days. So this is, we've got fluids moving, you know, almost a kilometer per day here. Uh, high pressure pulses that have been suddenly released um which is cool so that's suggesting that actually fluids can move really fast and that can the sudden changes in pressure can actually induce earthquakes and just to put that into perspective um, um if you don't believe me that that can happen just with some simple maths from um from uh a darcy's law you've all probably heard of darcy's law when you look at what permeability is to bang into your models or equations you know impermeable clay 10 to the minus 21 fractures very rough gravel 10 to the minus 12. well let's do a calculation if we have a bath with a plug right and I uh, replace that plug oh, as, a pl as a path of known dimensions. And I replace that plug, crappy Photoshop there, with a bit of tone light granite, yeah, granite plug. We're going to, we, we know the permeability of that plug. We know the level of water in the bath. We're going to calculate how quickly, with the pressure on that rock plug, how long it's going to drop half, uh, you know, half the bath uh, level. And that would take 2.5 million years with uh, such a low granite permeability, right? And, you know we've probably been wiped out by then uh, by other means, you know, so that's not going to happen. But it's it's very impermeable, right? Now, let's imagine we modify a bath, right? Because the pressure on the top of the plug, the driving force with Darcy's law is the height of the water, right? If we modify the bath to be seven kilometers tall, crazy, I know, but let's do that. Then this is, um, all that's happening here is that the pressure on the top of the plug is much, much higher and it's still atmospheric underneath. If we do the math again, you actually see that it will take to drop 25 centimeters. It'll still take a long time with this very impermeable granite, 183 years. But if we fractured that rock with a tiny little hairline fracture, the one that you can see in the field like that, you would actually move fluids through that fracture. Uh, in, so a whole bath full of fluids through a crack about two centimeters long um, in half a second. So it's a bathtub of water to a fracture this big, just like that. So if you've got the driving forces of trapped fluid pressures and you suddenly open cracks and permeability, then those fluids can actually move really, really quickly if the driving forces are there. And I chose that uh, seven kilometer height bath because that's the, the model that they had in, 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 in the Miller paper exactly. So we see examples of that actually after earthquakes. This is back in uh, Baja, California. This is uh, uh, Pescadora's fault. You can see uh, here directly after that 2010 rupture, Suddenly, these uh, these um, um, these fumaroles appeared because they dilated and opened, and fluids started coming out. And actually, uh, fluids that were about a kilometer down depth moved to the surface, you know, within less than a day. And you can see that sort of co-seismic fl fumaroles. So I'm 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 running out of time here. So hopefully, I'll just whiz this last bit, uh, four or five minutes. Um, I'm not going to too much detail, but we've been trying to reproduce these dynamic. So we're real. I've tried to argue to you that these, you know, the, these stresses are fast. Um, we have compressional forces and tensional forces. Um, and actually, when a rupture, as I showed in one of my slides, happens, they actually move along at very, very high speeds, kilometers per, per second, right? The rupture velocity, just below the shear wave, velo limited by the shear wave velocity of the rock. Um, and we have very strong compression and very strong uh, uh, tension. So that means is that if you're standing next to a fault and the rupture goes past you at three kilometers an hour, sorry, three kilometers a second, you're gonna have really strong vibrations, compressive ones, but also tensional ones. And actually, if you look at the real maths, you actually, not only will you have a one side of fault, you have compression, but you also have tension. So that means as an earthquake goes past you really fast, you not only get squashed quite quickly, you also get pulled quite quickly in like an oscillating effect. And this, um, and, and we, um, I've actually realized I repeated this, and. I'm going to skip that. So this um, uh, we try to reproduce that in the lab. So if I just this similar diagram, let's imagine that we are a, um, a foot point P on a fault. Uh, so this should be animated, but it's not. What, if we're at point P and this rupture whizzes past us at, uh, say, three or four kilometers per second. It's kind of like when you're standing on a platform. Uh, and if you've ever been to Japan and felt uh, when a, uh, a, um, a, um, 
Shinkansen, the high speed bullet train goes past you. If you're right in the platform, it's very likely you might actually get pulled off the pulled off the platform. But if you step away, the vibrations you feel from that train going past you really quickly get smaller and smaller. So that's exactly the same principle. The closer you are to the fault, the vibration, the faster that thing's going, the bigger vibrations and a bit of a shock that you get. And that's actually exactly what happens in rocks. This is a plot of a particle motion. Um, from an actual earthquake stress waves so you get very very fast particle motion because of these waves going past so you have very high stresses but you also have very short loading durations because of course this is moving past you so quickly and that because you get really high strain so in terms of geology we normally think of strain geological strains of you know like 10 to the minus five you know things like this we're talking strain rates of a thousand per second so really 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 fast and i'm probably going to skip a few slides and we actually think now that some of the rocks that we find on fault earthquake rocks which are called pulverized rocks which look completely shattered here you can see an example of that rock it looks like pristine granite but if you zoom in through the scales you can see this thing looks like it's been completely exploded um, uh, we actually think that's a, a field signature of earthquake shattering and Previously, I told you about pseudotaclites. For the last 20, 30 years, people have been using pseudotaclites as a smoking gun for earthquake uh, motion. But also, um, um, now we're starting to use these rocks called pulverized rocks uh, as evidence of, of earth, uh, earthquakes, uh, you know, ancient earthquakes going past. And you know, it's really important as a geologist to have evidence of ancient earthquakes because you know they can tell us what's actually going on in real earthquakes. Ten, uh, under the ground and so to give an example of this pulverized rock again i could have a whole lecture on pulverization i'm not going to do too much of that today i've only got a few more minutes left but this is an example of pulverization on the left versus the cataclastic so cataclastic rocks are when they smashed and ground up and rounded and so on fine grained pulverized rocks just look like they've been blown up like they exploded you don't see any sort of offset or anything like that you can see all these angular parts that fit together like a jigsaw um, and I'm going to skip this side because I'm running on si and slides. But one thing we see from the field, and this is sort of a multi-scale uh, like uh, uh, seismology lab and field observation, we find that these pulverized zones of really smashed up earthquake rock tend to be localized, you know, to about 50, 100 meters closest to the fault, meaning you know, that's where the stress waves from the earthquake rupture are the highest. And we're trying to do our best now to understand what happens in those um, in, in 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 experiments to. Uh, how you create these pulverized rocks and just summarizing that if you the reason that the reason that you get polarization is if you squash a rock very slowly like i showed you before um you'll actually get one big fracture forming and and then the rock explodes right but if you squash it really really fast you actually squash it faster than it can elastically expand and you actually get lots of fractures and it's strain rate dependent so you go slow you have one fracture you go really really fast you get lots of fractures and it's actually well known in the um, 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 materials community and it's called multi-fracturation like impact and nuclear explosions and stuff like that and you know you've seen these images before single fracture versus multiple fractures and we're realizing now that's you know something that you get in earthquakes and just as a, a quick last slide the sort of equipment you need these are like this is a fancy image this is just a big long bar of metal with a massive gas gun and what we do is we fire a bullet at like 50 meters a second into that and we can send a shock wave through that rock so load it really really quickly you know in, in microseconds put the stress on and what you find is that the faster you go the, the larger the amount of pulverization pulverization there is and that's for the same peak stress so you don't have to go any higher stress it's just by simply going a higher strain rate you get much much more damage and um, so this is i think my last slide just to summarize is that I hope what I've shown you today is some interesting stuff. The fault site, the fault seismic cycle is really complicated, right? We've got earthquakes that put all sorts of damage in there. That damage is strain rate dependent. It always also varies spatially around faults. Fluids can move very quickly depending on pressures, uh, also permeability paths and so on. Fractures also seal. Uh, I haven't talked about that too much. And then they control pure pressure. So if you think about how we predict earthquakes, you know, with all these really complicated things controlling it, you probably realize just how difficult that is to, that, that that makes it um and just showing you there's fracturing on many scales you know this that, that put these in context this is faulting at this scale right at the largest you know 20 kilometer scale let's zoom into that outcrop i showed you my student spent three months mapping and then his thin sections i didn't even show you where he's looked at the heterogeneity faults are really really complicated and the more we look at the high resolution tools drones and so on the more difficult it gets added to that cracks heal and i'm gonna have to skip this slide because i'm running low on time um, um cracks heal it's a diffusional process so just uh, just a takeaway message here is that a, cr a crack that's 100 microns long and 10 microns wide a little one that you might see will actually heal in about four hours okay 
we're not talking millions of years if uh, if you've got the pressure and temperature and they heal inwards from the tip inwards that's how you create fluid inclusion planes so fractures don't stay permeable for very long um you can see a fr uh, experiment here healing from the tip inwards there and uh and this, this last slide is uh, just another example in the field um showing a, a healing crack here and we can reproduce that in the, in the lab in, in just a month so my last this is my last slide i realize now i've said that a few times sorry uh, this is my last slide and uh, not not this one sorry i think i'm going to leave that there the seismic cycle is dynamic it's competition between earthquake damage and and so on fault slip generation healing can happen at very fast rates Mineralization can happen very fast, loads of complex feedbacks and looking at, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. And sorry for overrunning a bit. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks for that. It's a, it's covered an awful lot of material. I realize it's already one o'clock and some people might have to leave other things, but I, I think we should still have a few questions. If people need to leave, then so be it. But if the people, other people can remain if they, if they want to. Are there any questions? anyone if you can put your questions into the chat okay that all right i i've actually got a, i've got a quick question it's, it's probably a very naive question um i, I was very impressed by all these uh, experiments you know these videos you showed in the laboratory of crushing rocks and how you know the different strain rates and the different effects but i just wondering i guess it must be very important i'm sure it's something people have thought about but uh, you know compared to a rock that's several kilometers underneath the ground or even just a few hundred meters underground. How do things like, you know, the, the, the boundary conditions, the compressional, you know, the compression around the rock and things like temperature and and um, yeah. uh, temperature and, and depth, I mean, they must all make a big, a big difference to actually what you do in the laboratory and what happens in nature. I mean, how, how do you accommodate for that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question, actually, and it's a really difficult thing to do. Obviously, you have to start simple in the beginning. What In terms of pulverization, in terms of the stresses that you get, for example, some of the models that we, I showed you examples of pulverization when it's in compression, right? But the deeper you go um, to get the same amount of damage, you need to go have a faster rupture. And so once you get to like five or six kilometers depth, you actually need um, um, ruptures going at crazy speeds, of course, super shear, which are arguably rare and so on so to get the sort of stresses you need to pulverize what we see in the lab you can't really get those stresses below about four or five kilometers actually so limitation actually interestingly from the seismology they're seeing these low velocity zones seem to be limited to four or five kilometers anyway so they think a lot of this pulverization is a shallow phenomenon there's other models that um, predict like absolute tension and obviously when you're you know 10 kilometers under the ground to get your rock from 10 kilometers of pressure to absolute tension, you need like enormous rupture velocity. So there are lots of constraints in terms of um, um, the pressures where you'll get it. One thing we realize is that, yeah, the, high, the deeper you go, the harder it is to get the same amount of polarization, which means we, we, we strongly think, you know, that polarization is, is a more shallow phenomenon. That said, people are now finding examples of tensional cracks you know, set half the press, you know, like feather fractures, tensional fracture, fractures, you know, at several hundred kilometers in these really high pressure from really deep earthquakes. So that's obviously showing that you're still getting these dynamic stresses and tension locally as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot more to be done. But yeah, technically in the lab, it's very difficult. You know, I'm not anywhere near temperature, <laughs> for example. OK, uh, well, good. Uh, so I. I there's some other questions in the chat. So one of them is from Gareth Roberts. I wondered if, sorry, I wondered if there is anisotropy in the P wave models and if it changes through time as the fractures heal. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I I have that question actually to seismologists. So there's something. Um, not many. Most of the studies that have shown um, um, changes in P velocity, P wave velocity as a function of time. There's only about less than 10 papers that have shown it you know it's a few data points you know what i mean and that is just general velocity like like ground average velocity over all directions it would be great and one of the things we're hoping to do is actually where you could actually maybe get tomographic snapshot snapshots as a function of time you know a monthly one showing you know is it all or is it is it the whole five kilometers of healing it's probably not it's probably you know where is it healing and is there a preferred orientation so I, I think, uh, yeah, that's a really important question. And I think right now that's the way that we're going to be going. We are working with seismologists to do that. But yeah, that's a really important question. And there's another one from Bailey. How does fault ceiling affect? Yeah, you can uh, film yourself. <laughs> okay, yeah, Bailey's sorry, the next one, yeah. Sorry, not making, making you redundant, Max. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, 
How does fault ceiling affect future earthquakes in regards to ceiling affect uh, host rock stiffness? Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. So, um, it absolutely. Well, so so this increase in velocity, um, we actually don't know what's causing that. You know, so you could increase that. I've got a, have I got another slide here? I've got a slide here. Is that you could? If I just show that here. You could get that increase in velocity just by simply closing the cracks that are open. That would increase the velocity. You could heal them, zip them up, kind of like a zipper, like fluid inclusions, just by filling them with water. The velocity would go up, or by sealing them with minerals. You see what I mean? But obviously, and this is an example here. Of, uh, I've obviously been asked this question before. Similar ones you can see, like this is the ray path of the velocity of the seismologist. You know, this is the top four or five kilometers. So the temperatures are probably not really high enough to actually seal them mineralogically at those sort of time scales, you know, unless you're in somewhere like Iceland or something like that. So my feeling is it's much more likely to be um, uh, the fluid filling of cracks um, uh, doing that. For example, and obviously, if it's fluids filling cracks, then that's technically reversible. You know what I mean? Fluid doesn't necessarily. If your question comes to the rock stiffness, like uh, Poisson's ratio and 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 and, and Young's modulus and so on. Fluids filling cracks don't affect it, but healing of cracks would affect it. You see what I mean? So actually, that's an important question because um, if this healing is happening, you know, over several years, that means that the stiffness is probably changing. You know, some of these mechanisms, if they're correct, is also changing. And, you know, and we have aftershocks happening in these zones over several years. So that means, you know, when you're modeling the earthquake, you can't just use a single, you know, stiffness parameter. You have to also maybe start thinking about, you know, are these things, you know, are, the, are, are those parameters healing with time too? So that's a really good question. Um What's next? Okay, great. There's one more question from. Well, make this the last question. There's one question from Stephen Hicks. He's, oh yeah, Steve. Regarding damage on perovulation due to pulses of seismic waves and the rupture velocity, presumably the perovulation effect is strongest in the direction of the rupture due to uh, directivity. Can you understand why it's unfolding? Yeah, you know what? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't go into too much. I already put too much in. I realized after the talk. But um, so one of the things. Uh, Several of the models, um, uh, like for example, the Benzai models predict um, um, strong asymmetry to polarization. They expect, they predict it would only be on the tensional side with a strong tension where you have a bimaterial interface. Uh, and in which case you would expect a sudden reduction in the fault normal stress, which would mean you would there probably expect, you know, if you're reducing the fault normal stress very quickly, you would maybe expect fault parallel fractures. And that's exactly what we see in some of this. We see a general preferred orientation um, um, uh, parallel to the fault. I probably whizzed through that uh, slide a bit too much. Where is it? It was just, oh, where is it? Uh, bear with me. It was the sorry, this one. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if you can see. Actually, so this is orientated some. So you can probably see here um, the orientations of these things, these uh, sort of balls uh, orientated relative to the uh, an isotropy. So we actually do see a nice, um, you know, uh, a, a velocity which would fit with full opening mode fractures. Um, and and yeah, you would also yeah you also get strong you know directivity effects. So yeah, I mean we we often use uh, Yehuda has been using the the asymmetry for example of finding a polarization to infer the rupture direction of angels just like we do with student attack lights as well. And now some of the deep earthquake people are doing people are finding deep, examples of deep earthquake uh, feather fractures which imply, in, imply tension. They're also using that to in, to, to infer rupture directivity too. Okay. Can you? Oh, yeah, there's one from John Paul. That's a good yeah, question. Yeah. I just deleted that slide uh, just before I came in. Um, and I'm going to go back to it. It's my spare slides thing here. That's a good question. We absolutely, that's exactly what we have done. Uh, yeah. And if you can bear with me one second, I don't mind if people have to drop off. There is a slide. Yeah, it's not like when you've got a room booking and you have to leave for the next. And that is also true, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so I don't actually have the uh, slide here. I've annoyingly deleted it. Let me just figure it out there. Da, 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 da. No, anyway, the answer to your question is yes, we can. We actually, in for something like that, um, about 10 to 15 percent um, of the total but, but rupture energy is being used for the fracturing off fault in our experiments and that's done and actually 
10 years ago, people were saying it was 50% of the budget. So actually, while I've been arguing to you that it's really important, right? It's, it's much less than we used to think of it from field studies 10, 15 years ago. It's probably about you know, maximum 20%. And that's now agreeing with... Um, that's now agreeing with uh, th theoretical studies, but one of the one of the key issues actually is can we? That's for a single. So most of the stuff we do in the lab is like for single events, you know. Then you've got damaging, um, right? Coming back to coming back to Bailey's question, um, you know, once you've got a fault created and you have an earthquake, that's kind of like you start you have multiple earthquakes, so you're gonna have an evolving stiffness with time. So one of the things we're trying to do in UCL, which is, is is for the thumper and so this is one of the machines we've been building which is actually allows us to do high speed impacts but high speed tension but it allows us to do um you know multiple impacts to look at how the damage evolves evolves with time uh you know and how it overprints um obviously further than line, it'd be nice to include healing as well but for now the key issue you know is and, and i think what we find is when you create pockets of damage those heterogeneous zones they're actually preferential zones for more damage so once you develop a bit of heterogeneity the whole fault zone starts becoming even more heterogeneous because that's where it prefers to fracture more mm. so yeah i think it's got we realize now it's it's got to be a combined deal you know, of modeling versus experiments in terms of thinking what that happens in terms of you know rupture propagation and how it evolves with time on the fault Okay. Mm. Good. I can hang oh. around a bit if people want to ask more questions and other people want to disappear, but there's no more questions in the chat. Um, okay, for the people who are still here, I'm not going to show people who are still, oh, there's still nearly 20 or so. We just uh, perhaps thank Tom one more time, and then if people do want to ask any more questions, I'm sure he'll stay around for a few more minutes. So another... thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Doesn't work so well, does it, when you've got... <laughs>